it's my privilege to uh, moderate a bit of a panel um, with just four of, uh, the, of the people that work with us and are a part of the medical projects uh, that we do around the world. These are folks, uh, some of which work for us, uh, some of which uh, go on very short notice um, in response to some kind of a disaster. And without these people that literally put their lives, uh, put their work, um, put their families on hold, we couldn't do the work and do the kinds of responses that Shannon was talking Talking about. Uh, so they are so critical to our work, we're very thankful to them. So I'm going to introduce them to you one at a time. Uh, let's hold our applause until the end. Uh, we'll have them come up and then we'll, uh, we'll start to talk to them and, and get to know them. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Sharla Booty. Sharla Booty, come on up, is uh, a registered nurse uh, here in Calgary and uh, over the last couple of years has found herself uh, in Iraq and in Bangladesh. Uh, next, we have Dr. Doug Notterbrock, and uh, Dr. Doug comes to us from Kelowna, and uh, he too has found himself in Iraq and the Philippines and numerous other places, and uh, just flew in a few hours ago from Kelowna to be with us here tonight, so thank you, uh, Doug, for being here. Karen Daniels, also uh, a registered nurse. Karen comes from Vancouver, but practices all over the world. Maybe parts unknown is what we should say. Uh, Karen has worked with Samaritan's Purse since 2002 and is on the front lines of a lot of our medical programming that we're doing. And then finally, John Troke, registered nurse, recently from Kelowna, just moved here to Calgary, working out of our office, literally living out of a suitcase, uh, no defined address, and uh, has some great stories to tell. So can we welcome uh, each of our um, personnel here tonight? Well, first of all, thank you for being here uh, to each one of you. Uh, great, to, um, great to have you here and to uh, tell the stories and share some of your experiences. So, Karen, you've been around the longest. Let's, uh, let's start with you. So, I I'm interested, guys, in hearing a little bit about your story. Um, you went to med school. You went to nursing school. You trained to go into this profession. Why did you end up doing what you're doing with Samaritan's Purse? Tell us briefly about that journey, Karen. Sure. Well, like I said, my name is Karen Daniels, and I grew up on the other side of the Rockies in Cranberry, BC. Um, and so um, I actually did for my first training here in Calgary, so it has a special place in my heart. And I'd always had a, a heart for um, working internationally. My parents both worked for Health Canada uh, with the First Nations people um, when I was young, and so I always had that part of in a, a part of me and so honestly I I never felt that call to go to Africa so per se I never dreamed of it my whole life but I probably went with the sort of you know less than altruistic purposes of like I wanted to have an adventure um, and so I took a six-month leave of absence from my job and I got hired by Samaritan's Purse to go to a little hospital called Louis Hospital in Sudan um, all I knew about Sudan and about tropical medicine was basically what I had seen on a map and read a few articles about. I really should have never been hired. I don't know why anyone hired me. I would not hire me now. Um, but I went and God saw, I think, what I maybe had a selfish motive. Um, and he turned that into what turned into from a six-month contract to a 16-year um, career. And uh, I was taught by former rebel soldiers on how to take care of war wounded and tropical medicine. Um, and I had an American surgeon that taught me a ton. And so that really was my motivation. I, I went with, you know, the thought of having having an adventure and, and God totally changed my heart along the way and it, it's been amazing I wouldn't trade it for the world and uh, I'll keep doing it as long as I can until uh, he gives me a different calling so so Karen let's talk about some of the recent projects that you've been a part of um, it, we use the term changing people's lives sometimes I think a little flippantly but some of the surgical camps you've been a part of, cleft lip, cleft palate, literally has been changing people's lives. Tell us a little bit about where you've done those and what exactly is involved uh, in those projects. 
Yeah, um, so I had the privilege of being the health manager in Sudan and South Sudan for many years, and in that, we started our very first cleft mission in South Sudan. Again, I had no idea how to do a cleft mission, but I'm a trained operating room nurse, and so they're like, you're gonna do a cleft mission. Um, and so I, I recruited uh, one of my best friends here to come along with me to run a cleft mission, and we kind of figured it out together. And uh, five years ago, I uh, finished my contract in South Sudan, and that time I needed to come back to Canada. And uh, so then SP approached me and said, would you work for us full time and take it um, to some of our other um, country offices? And so from there, we've established the program. It's been running for almost five years, four and a half years. We program in Sudan and Liberia, uh, Bolivia. We're in the process of working at, looking at opening up Myanmar um, next year. Um, for a project, and so uh, as the door opens, that's what we do. We've also just started a cataract uh, program, the cataract surgical program, and our very first program that we cut our teeth on last, last year was on Ebola survivors. Many Ebola survivors have a, a high incidence of ophthalmology problems, and cataracts being one of them, and so we did a mission there on Ebola survivors, which was very meaningful for me because I had responded to the Ebola crisis in 2014 in Liberia, and uh, so God totally brought it full circle. I got to see um, many of the survivors that I had um, met along the way and got to care for them and see their vision restored. And so it's been very redemptive for me because in aid work, as all these folks will tell you, if you're in it long term, it's, there's not a lot of um, instantaneous gratification. And, and God's given me a program now where I, within an hour, within nine minutes sometimes in our cataract surgeries, we see uh, absolutely changed lives. And so it's been, it's helped me stay the long haul with this, um, you know, medical missions and, and humanitarian aid. So we've talked a little bit about Ebola. Um, Shannon talked about that. We're all very much aware, uh, only a few years out from uh, how we saw Ebola and the effects it had in West Africa, in Liberia, uh, specifically where we had an office. You were there. We're going to see you a little bit in the movie. Um, Karen, just kind of revisit a little bit in terms of as a healthcare provider, being in that context, literally not knowing where is this thing going next, and perhaps connect that with your faith as well. Um, so reconciling your faith to being on the front lines of something that we really didn't know an awful lot about and which way it was going and what it was doing. Yeah, um, you know, I'll be honest and say Ebola is the scariest thing I've ever done. Ebola response was the scariest thing I ever did. I had no idea. I thought I'd kind of seen everything. Um, I'd worked in a lot of war zones. I, I was familiar with that. but. The war that you cannot see is one of the most frightening you'll ever experience in your life. And I went because one of my uh, dear friends had asked if I would come and help him, Dr. Ed Carnes. He's kind of a legend in the Samaritan's Purse medical uh, realm. And I had always promised him that if ever he called me, I would show up. And so he said, I need you. And I said, OK. And again, I went for two weeks. It's turned into a five and a half week mission. It. it it uh, was one of the hardest things I've ever done, but I would do it again in a heartbeat. Um, it's very, very different. It, it pulls out everything. As a, as a healer, um, you, are, you engage with people in a way where you use comfort and you use touch and you spend time with them. And Ebola took that from you. You had no ability to spend more than a few minutes with people. You have a very um, set amount of time you're able to stay in the suit, the heat, drains you incredibly. We had a, a lot of patients to see, a huge volume, and you can't use touch, you can't hold children. People are very, very isolated, and so it was very, very, very hard. And then to have our colleague, Kent Brantley, who you'll see in the movie tonight, get sick. And we knew, when I first went in, the mortality rate associated with Ebola virus disease was 90%, and so we knew that unless God did a miracle, he was gonna die, and he was gonna die in a very terrible way, and we, all of us that were providers, saw that. And so it was one of the, probably one of the darkest times that I've had, and yet uh, Jesus was there. We always say, a good friend of mine, Bev Caulfield, who's a Canadian, has been sent by this office. Um, in Liberia, we'll see her again in the film tonight, you used to say, you know, we were in uh, the, the hallways of hell, but the angels were with us, and God was with us, and he showed up, and he helped us, and he sustained us, and I'll never forget it. Um, it was one of the most... Um, life-changing experiences I've ever had. Thanks, Karen. John, 
So, um, if I recall, we hired you initially to go to Haiti after the earthquake there. And uh, tell us a little bit about your journey and how you ended up working with Samaritan's Purse. Mine's a little bit different th from Karen's. Is when I was 13, I went on a mission trip, the typical 13-year-old mission trip to Mexico. Um, and God really put a, a longing in my heart to go serve overseas or uh, serve uh, a population that needed, needed help. And when I graduated high school, I really didn't know what to do with my life, um, but decided I wanted to do something that would get me overseas and into the, into the field. Um, and nursing was one of those things that I could do. And I knew that I, it would provide me with a job in North America, but um, more importantly, it would get me overseas and get me working where I wanted to be and where I felt God wanted me to be. Um, so I, I took the course, I graduated, um, and mine was a slower process getting into um, the field. It, it actually took me a long time to find an opportunity, but um, in Haiti, after the earthquake, I volunteered for a quick two-week mission with, with Samaritan's Purse, um, doing post-op surgeries after the earthquake, and followed that up with going back um, after cholera. And um, cholera is where God really began to touch my heart and uh, show me that uh, this is where I was meant to be for, um, for the meantime and for the and for the near future. And uh, he really grabbed a hold of my heart and I, I actually took a position as a medical coordinator there um, for the next year or so working with SP. And then from that point on, um, on and off, I've gone on uh, disaster response missions to, um, all around the world with SP. Um, but as Karen talked about South Sudan, I went to South Sudan for three years and spent three years doing medical programming. and. I think as I got my foot in the door and moved on from Haiti to the Philippines, I really realized um, something that caught my attention is what our vice president says, is uh, the quality of our work is the platform of our witness. Um, and I really saw that with Samaritan's Purse, that uh, because we provided quality work, we, even though we were working in a limited resources country, we, we always gave quality care and we always provided the best care possible for the patients and uh, through that we were able to have a witness to the patients we were dealing with without even saying anything um, and that always opened a door for us to uh, kind of share the love of Christ with these people and that's what really drew me to uh, to Samaritan's Purse and working long term um, and so I took the position in in South Sudan um, and really kind of appreciated the work yeah. there. And John, uh, you've been pretty busy since you've moved here to our, in, uh, to our office, um, literally weeks ago being uh, in DRC. Uh, we've been talking about Ebola here with Karen in Liberia, and of course you were involved in that as well. Maybe just come full circle on that in terms of uh, what's happening in DRC right now, what you were doing there, uh, and some of the work which is taking place there in, in regards to Ebola still. Yeah, so uh, for, for those of you who aren't familiar, Ebola is back in the DRC and um, has kind of, it's been, a, it's been a tough haul there because of insecurity in the country uh, and just the beliefs of uh, some of the people in the country. It's been hard to get under control. Uh, so we have a, a kind of a sister hospital that we support there a little bit. And my, my job this time was to go back and just teach them um, basic infection protection control measures for the hospital, how to screen patients to see if they have Ebola, and, and then basically how to put on protective equipment so that if they do see a patient that they suspect, uh, suspect might have Ebola, um, how to put on the proper equipment to protect themselves and protect others, protect their families and protect the community. Uh, and that was a, an opportunity that uh, we had from our experience in Liberia. So coming full circle from Liberia, there's very few organizations that actually have experience in treating Ebola or dealing with Ebola, and we're one of the one of the two or three that actually does it well. So, uh, co going into an, an area where we already have connections with hospitals is is what I was there to do. Yeah, great. Thanks, John. I'm, I'm just going to slide over to this side of the room here now. So, Sharla, uh, local uh, local nurse. Uh, first uh, engaged with us into Iraq. You were in on that first wave, and we'll talk about uh, Iraq with you and Doug, but um, most recently you've been in Bangladesh. Um, and uh, one of the things that this work has opened doors for us to do is to um, 
come into contact with peoples and groups of people that perhaps otherwise we would not have the ability to do, that there would just be restrictions on um, going to these places or planting churches or doing some of these kinds of work, but because of the migration of people, because of the movement of refugees, uh, because of uh, situations of conflict and war, we find ourselves engaging with people where we have a pretty unique opportunity uh, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So, Sharla, Bangladesh, tell us uh, what was happening in Bangladesh and what were you doing there? Yeah, so um, when I was in Bangladesh, we we were responding to diphtheria, um, which is something here that we all get vaccinated for when we're very young. And so even as a registered nurse, I had heard of the vaccine, but I really didn't have an understanding of what it was um, before the outbreak started happening in the, in the camps there. So all of the refugees that had fled from uh, major persecution and genocide in Myanmar had come to a, a good chunk of them were in Bangladesh and um, they were suffering with diphtheria as well as numerous other health concerns with just where they were staying. Um, the refugee camps were, you know, uh, very condensed and there wasn't a lot of space and there were not very many resources for all the people that were there. So um, diphtheria is essentially um, respiratory um, in its uh, it's a respiratory and it has um, like a white kind of gray mucus membrane that kind of sticks from all the way to your nasal passage all the way down your throat and, and through and it can really um, inhibit your breathing and that's very um, dangerous especially for kids because their airways are so small. And so um, you also get this bull neck and nodules in your throat and it's very painful. And so um, it's very treatable. You can treat it with vaccines, but people just did not get them and they're living in such terrible conditions that they weren't able, most of them had never received vaccines before. So we were treating that with something called, uh, or with DAT, we called it. So it's diphtheria antitoxin. And it's actually not a drug that we're able to regularly give here. It's not FDA approved. And uh, it's because people have such severe reactions to it. So um, you get severe rigors, severe hives. Um, People will often go into anaphylaxis and um, they don't respond very well to it. And so what we do is we just treat the symptoms. So we will give um, medications to help treat um, their symptoms and pray that they get through it. And some people, when they start going through anaphylaxis, you have to stop. And so that's essentially what we were doing while we were there. But it was a very neat experience because you got invited into a country that Christians aren't really um, welcomed into. And we got to work beside refugees that, that had jobs there. So Rohingya who were translators and um, living in these refugee camps, but also working with us as well as the locals. So you get to show love to not only the local people that are there working and serving, who have a lot of hostility towards the Rohingya who have come into their country um, quite unwelcomed and you get to share the love of Christ there. So it was a very powerful experience, very difficult as well to see a lot of kids. Um, I want to come back to you in a second here, Charlotte, to talk about Iraq, but uh, Doug, uh, you were a part of that uh, first wave as well um, over um, early 2016. Over the Christmas holidays, we were going back and forth, and we had many of our um, uh, many of our DART personnel on alert. We weren't sure if we were going to uh, be flying on Christmas Day or what it was. Everybody, literally, their lives were on hold. And I think about the 27th or the 28th of December, we got the green light, and we started getting you guys over there. You were a part of the setup. Uh, you were uh, you were working in the ER of the emergency field hospital. Maybe for some context, Doug, tell us a little bit about how the EFH was set up and who it was serving. Thanks, Ian. So, yeah, so 2016, late 2016, there was a a battle going on that the world was following uh, against ISIS in in the Middle East in uh, Mosul, near Mosul. And uh, one of the oldest uh, continuously inhabited cities in the world, and everybody remembers uh, Jonah from the Old Testament, and uh, he was told to go to Nineveh. And, and so there was some ancient context here. And uh, the land was uh, taken over by ISIS to um, dominate that area for their caliphate. 
And there was a battle going on by um, the Iraqi government and the rest of the world called groups uh, funded by Iran and things like this, all working against ISIS and driving them back towards Mosul from uh, Kurdistan. And um, so the <coughs> some land was procured there. Uh, Samaritans first had been doing some food distributions uh, in that area. But, uh, that was fairly risky work uh, without um, probably adequate security. You know, it was, it was risky business. And as the, the battle line drew back towards Mosul, the, um, the idea came forth that we need to set up a hospital in that area. And so um, the, the government put out a, a request, and Samaritan's Purse was the first group to put up their hands, says, we'll go. And other groups that had been working in war for their entire, for decades, uh, uh, and even in that country, um, didn't feel comfortable going into that area. But Samaritan's Purse, as Kenny uh, Isaacs would say, um, we don't run away from the fire, we run towards the fire. And Samaritan's Purse moved in, set up a field hospital and some land that had been procured uh, in Bartella, just uh, immediately outside of uh, um, Mosul, uh, right at the uh, line, what was at that time the, the, the battle line. And so I think there was a, a, a multi-acre property that was set up. The field hospital, so, so there we are geographically, and that's what's going on around us. And so the call came, and, and we eventually deployed in late December, I think just after Christmas in 2016. And just getting everybody there that arrived uh, from all over the world, really, at that time was somewhat of a miracle, I've got to say. And it's a difficult time of year to procure uh, medical teams. Um, tr you know, try to drop everything right at Christmas. Try to get uh, surgeons and anesthetists and a bunch of doctors and nurses together in Iraq uh, at Christmas time. Uh, th that's a challenge. And so this all actually just happened. And it, ha it unfolded fairly rapidly. And within 10 days, we had a, a full tier three emergency field hospital set up uh, on, the, on the plains of Nineveh. Uh, just outside of Mosul, this ancient city with this context going on, and it was unbelievable. And so there's this war going on just uh, um, around the corner, as it were, and we get set up, and we went live in early January. I uh, don't remember the exact date now. The, the third? Yeah, I think perhaps? Third. Yeah. Yep. And uh, so from the, the moment the doors were open, um, one of the uh, re sort of retired former Iraqi Special Forces guys uh, said to me uh, before we were open, he says, Doc, get ready. It's not going to be good. And our doors were open and the, the, the war wounded that first week was all women and children. It was unbelievable. Just uh, one after another, multiples at a time, multiples per day, multiple times per day, multiple trauma, multiple mass trauma, all coming in hot and heavy. And it was overwhelming, I gotta say, it was, it was uh, the real deal. And then once we got through that first week, then uh, things uh, uh, drifted a little bit into we were starting to see soldiers on both sides. As uh, any humanitarian group setting up in a war zone would see, you would see um, operatives from both sides coming in to your uh, trauma hospital. So that's uh, what was going on and uh, there were a lot of challenges. Uh, when, you, when you come into our hospital from uh, Mosul, where the, the main battle was going on, and this was eastern Mosul, up to the Tigris River. Everybody remembers the Euphrates and the Tigris River from grade 9 history class, I think, and Mesopotamia. Well, that's where we were. And uh, so uh, the battle for eastern Mosul was on um, that first month or so, up until early February. And uh, things progressed. And so people would come in from the war zone by uh, ambulances, from the uh, Red Crescent predominantly that were picking up people and bringing them out to us because we were about two or three K out of town, I think. And uh, so they would come into our emergency hospital. They would become uh, uh, patients. Uh, they would be, um, there was some security procedures that had to be done because it's a very different context. We've got to look for weapons and bombs and things. So once that happens as quickly as possible, they would come into our resuscitation bay after a rapid triage. In triage, uh, if anybody's ever been to the hospital in Calgary or at home in Canada, um, 
Yeah, triage can be kind of a nice, pleasant place. You know, it's nice and warm and cozy, and you're welcome. They check their blood pressure. Well, our triage is a little bit different. And bam, so you get triaged in 10 or 15 seconds into one of four categories. You're, you're going to uh, die. Sorry, we don't have the resources, so some tough ethical decisions. And or you're, you're immediately you're red and you're going to move right into resuscitation, right into the OR, or be actively resuscitated in the emergency department. Uh, or get triaged into other categories that can wait until the, the more urgent cases uh, uh, can uh, be dealt with. So that's what was going on. Yeah. Um... It, it's you know hear, hearing all of this right. It's it's I think very difficult for us to sort of comprehend the uh, the stress and the energy and everything which is taking place in the midst of that and the incredible stress. I mean, you all four of you served uh, at the EFH outside Mosul, uh, but, but Charlotte, I just want to go back to you here. Um, you know, we've called this. Uh, night about medical miracles. I wonder if, if briefly, and we're running out of time here, but could you just uh, briefly give us a, a capture, something miraculous that you saw uh, your time serving in the EFH? Yeah, so I'll just um, start out by saying a little bit of the layout that we had. Um, so we had three wards when I was there. We had women and children, which was always full, and then we had um, EC, which we called enemy combat, so that was suspected ISIS. And then we had ISF, which was Iraqi soldier forces. So I had been in every ward but the enemy combat ward for probably about two weeks, and it was my day to go in to the EC ward. And I was terrified, I was angry, um, angry that some of these people that I would be treating um, had done this to my patients in the other ward. Um, and I was a little bit, you know, worried for my safety as well. So when I went in, um, the Holy Spirit honestly just gave me such a peace and a love and a compassion for the people that were in this EC ward. Um, and I remember starting one of my days and there was a young man in there and he was very angry. He had just this look in his eyes that you're like, I don't want to go near him. Um, and he had just had I think he just had his leg amputated that morning um, and shrapnel wounds and gunshot wounds kind of all over. And so I'd been taking care of him through the day. Um, and then finally he had gone to sleep for a little bit and we were all like, oh, thank God um, he's sleeping so we can rest for a little bit um, in terms of not worrying about any chaos that he'd be causing. Um, and then all of a sudden he woke up um, and he started saying, Messiah, Messiah, Messiah. And he just kept repeating that. And he had had a vision and all that, like, we don't have a clue what's going on. So we're looking at the translators back and forth, like, why is he screaming? And God had given him a vision of Jesus. And so his demeanor had just completely changed from uh, very angry and a man that you could see was in so much bondage. And his heart was just completely transformed. And the next day that you went into that ward, you'd see him trying to convince his friends, like, look, this is... Jesus is the way, like, he, we, we'd, we would hear this from the translators, because obviously we can't speak Arabic, but um, he would be saying that. And so we saw many miracles like that, where people that came in that were suspected or confirmed ISIS would turn to Christ, or people that were there would say, why are you here? And you'd be able to say, because Jesus loves you, and because we love you, and we want to show you that tangibly in a way that you can feel and experience. And so um, that was probably one of the most powerful stories. Yeah. And there's many, like, that. We heard them all the time. Yeah. I'm sure everybody can share some of those, um, yeah, miraculous stories of what was taking place.